I think there's been a lot of sermons already preached this morning, and God has really touched your pastor. I know he's not been feeling good, um, but uh, wow, he inspires me every time I come, and I hope you're inspired, and the worship and everything. Wow, and pray God continue to bless you and heal you. And I did tell Pastor Brian, I think, what his problem was this week. His sickness was buck fever. <laughs> you get a fever when you're looking out of your buck blind, your deer blind, and you see these big deer right in front of you right out here in the field, and you start to get trembles and shakes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But and anyway, I'm sure it, it's something different than that. But um, I do want to say that... Um, we talked about who our heroes were. When I was growing up, Saturday morning was the time we got to watch a little of the westerns and our heroes. And I guess, I guess one of my favorites was Superman. But, but when they started to make cell phones, they took away the phone booths, and he no longer had a place to change. You know, he'd go in a phone booth, take off his regular outfit, and next thing you know, he's flying out of there as Superman. Well, that's never worked for me. I didn't go in phone booths, come out looking the same way I went in. But, but, but anyway... Um, Pastor Brian mentioned about Noah, and the next time you watch a football game, which for some of you might be this afternoon if you're an Eagles fan. Any Eagles fans here? Yeah, there's a few. Um, just pause for a moment as you watch a game, whether you're watching on TV or you go to a stadium. If you don't watch it at all, it's okay. But next time you tune and you see a football stadium, just think about the size of the ark. Now, we just had friends that came back from a trip in Kentucky, and if you'd like to go on a, a great trip, take a day trip or take a two days to get there and spend a week or so. Um, visit the Ark in Kentucky and then visit the Creation Museum, both built by the same ministries. How many have ever been out there, by the way, to the Ark and the Creation Museum? Okay. Um, we were there a number of years ago. I just stood there. I was just in awe. It's one thing to read the whole description in the scripture, but then you're there and you're looking at, and this is built to scale. And then you go inside and it's like, Wow, and who says the animals couldn't fit in it? Really? God knows what he's doing. And so next time you're at a football game and you're standing there or you're sitting there or you're watching it on TV, just take this thought for a moment. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long. The football field is 100 feet long. Okay, that's the place that the guy's playing on down there, all right? That's, that's uh, 100 yards. And you know, those of you who watch football, they have to get 10 yards for a first down, and it goes down the field and all that kind of stuff. So picture a football field and another half a football field. That's how long the arc was. And when you're sitting there and you're looking at this, it's like awesome. And then the width of it, it says it's 75 feet wide. That's almost the length of one football field, 100 feet, I mean 100 yards. Um, I'm getting this right here. Uh, no, excuse me, I got it wrong. Uh, 75 feet wide, which would be, um, you know, whatever. Um, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. So when you think about that, when you're looking at a football field, that was an awesome boat. Uh, never one had been built like that before. And when you consider what God has called us to do in being light in, in a world that's lost, um, don't think we're going to go through without persecution. It's just going to happen. There's no way you and I are going to avoid it. And if you read between the lines, you've got to imagine that Noah faced a lot of persecution. I mean, first of all, he heard from God, right? And he's building a boat, right? And it's going to rain, and the whole earth is going to be flooded. And if there had been an insane asylum, they would have probably lock him up, right? Yeah, the fact checkers, they weren't around then, which was a good thing, you know. Um, but they would all have been proven wrong. Um, but anyway, when you think about what he did and that the ark is the picture of, of Jesus' of salvation, um, awesome what God had him build. And, of course, as God promised, the rain did come. And uh, the day of mercy was over when God shut the door. Now just think about this. If Noah had closed the door and the rain was coming down, the waters were coming up, I'm sure there have been some people knocking on the door saying, hey, no, I changed my mind. I really believe in, in what you've been preaching and that this is of God. I want to come into the boat. I want to be saved. But God shut the door. And as Pastor Brian said, you make your choices now to serve Jesus. There are no second chances. When you die, 
Your decisions here determine where you'll live forever, heaven or hell. That's all through Scripture. Except Jesus. He loves you. If you're listening online, if you're here in person, the way of salvation is Jesus. And uh, if, you, if you never got to see it, the next time it comes around, it's sight and sound, when they do Noah, I was so impressed when we watched Noah toward the end when they showed the ark, and at the end of the ark, they showed, I think, like the cross, and Jesus comes walking out of the ark. How many remember that? Is that my right? Does I remember right? And like Jesus is the ark of salvation. He is the one we trust in him, and he is the one that we find safety in in our world. And so today is the day of salvation. The day is the day of mercy. The door of the ark is still open. Jesus invites all. The plan is for all that could be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. But again, it's based on a choice. Um, I grew up in church. I was in church all the time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If there were special meetings, we were there. Um, there was no flipping of the coin to see if we're going to go to church or stay home and watch something on TV, even on Sunday night. I'll talk about Sunday nights. Um, during the week, there's revivals. We were in church all the time. But I still had to make a choice to follow Christ. Being in church didn't make me a Christian. Being in the church gave me an opportunity because I was getting good food all the time. And sometimes, if you grew up in church, you maybe didn't appreciate it because you thought oh, everybody's out there having fun. My friends can stay home and watch Disney on Sunday night. I got to go to church, you know. Or they go to a ball game. I'm in church. I look back and I'm so grateful for those days. And if you grew up in church, you have to be grateful for, for parents who took your Sunday school bus that picked you up or however you got there, friends and neighbors. You got, you got blessed at an early age. And those of you that came in, wherever you came into the church, to Jesus, praise God, he showed mercy. And you found him before it was too late. Because, look, I, I'm a pretty realistic person. I read papers. I read the news. You know, there's people that die every day, people that didn't plan to die. We took a trip. We've known a lot of traveling this last week. Went out north of Pittsburgh to a funeral for a friend of ours. And... Uh, before we left on Wednesday to come back, we had like two to three inches of snow out there in uh, Grove City by now north of Pittsburgh. Down here, you didn't have anything. How many are glad you're, you're not ready to shovel snow yet or deal with that? But an icy spot of snow and ice on Route 80, there was an accident and there was a person killed. I'm sure they were on their way to work or traveling somewhere to visit someone, whatever. They had no plans that there was going to be an accident, but their life is over. I have no idea who the person is. All I know is their life ended. And this happens every day. There's people in different situations, whether it's sickness, accidents, wars, all the things that are taking place in, in Israel and Palestine and Ukraine, Russia. So live for Jesus. You will never regret it. I'll say it again. Live for Jesus. You will never regret it. He will bless your life. Amen. He'll help you with everything you're going through. And we're going to be talking about that this morning, about you can cope with God's hope. When we're in 1 Peter chapter 1, um, just two verses, though I'm going to read from the beginning of, of verse 3. If you can find your spot there, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. Not a great word. His great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. You know, in heaven, you don't have to worry about, oh, I think the roof's leaking. Uh, I'll probably could call a roofer. Probably going to have shingles put on. I know this church here dealt with some leaks for a long time. Am I right? Because I've talked to Pastor Brian and Paul and one of those spots that was so hard to find. And if you're a roofer, that's the worst. We know it's leaking. Where's the water coming in? Okay? When you can find that out, then you can fix it. But if you can't find it out, it's like you're, you know, experimenting. I'm male over here over there. And uh, the Church of God out there in Tyanesta where we went um, after the funeral for, for a meal for our uh, sister in the Lord, Christy Money, who was one of our teachers at our school, Bethel Christian Academy, um, their church isn't even 20-some years old. And all I'm saying is someone who built that church didn't put a good roof on it. Now, if you're building an industrial building, you at least put a 30-year roof on it, if not more. They're looking at a new roof, 
And the pastor sat next to us as we were at the meal, my wife and I were talking. She said, we got estimates as high as $300,000. And it's not that huge a facility. She said, the best estimate we got from someone who's working with us, it gave us a little discount, it's like $85,000. Woo! You know what? In heaven, nothing's going to leak. <laughs> we visited the Breakers years ago, uh, uh, the, the Newport. The lifestyles of the rich and famous turned the century. If you ever been up to Newport, Rhode Island, the Vanderbilts. Does that ring a bell, anybody? Ding, ding, ding. Are you related to them? If you are, you can maybe call in some money. They were the wealthiest people in America at one time. The Vanderbilts. In Newport are summer homes. At summer homes. Summer homes. Okay. They are now museums. A lot of people go through them, oh my goodness. The breakers, it's like incredible. You could fit, my home, I could probably fit 10 of my homes into that home. That was a summer home. And the kids' playhouse in the backyard was bigger than the house we lived in at the time when we visited there. However, like anything that man builds, it needs repairs. The roof was leaking. They were taking up a fund to put a new roof on this Breakers, one of the Vanderbilt's summer homes. They were asking for a million dollars to fix the roof. And I walked away saying, thank you, Jesus. I know if my roof of my house goes bad, it should cost more than 5000 A million dollars. So when you look at what Scripture says about heaven, all the things we're not really necessarily talking about, all the beauties of heaven, but hallelujah, the inheritance we have in heaven, nothing's going to perish, spoil or fade. One of the reasons we know evolution is a terrible, flawed theory is things don't go uphill, they go downhill. If they went uphill, that means the paint on your house will look better now than when you bought it 20 years ago. Your roof shingles will be better now than when you bought your house 20 years ago. Your plumbing system in your house will be better. You understand know, you know what I'm talking about? Everything goes uphill. How many know that's a lie? It doesn't go uphill. Everything goes downhill. That's why roofers will always be in business. Plumbers will always be in business. Interior designers will always be in business. People that remodel and tear out stuff where the termites have eaten and replace it with stuff, they'll always be in business. Those things are down. Not in heaven. Everything is perfect in every way. Nothing will have to be changed. There'll be no repairs needed. And speaking of that, we'll have no problems with our bodies. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Pastor Brian's been feeling a little under the weather this week. I've had my share, and I don't care what you do, you and I will never stop the aging process. Go ahead. Spend all the time you want. Knock yourself out. Bang your head against the wall. Do whatever. Spend all kind of money. There's a millionaire. I, might, I think he's close to a billionaire. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, uh, but you know how preachers repeat themselves. But if I did, I, it bears repeating. He's taking like 112 pills a day, and he's getting plasma from his son, who's 20. And he says he's going to reverse the aging process. Now, this was just in the news a week or so ago. And I'm reading, I'm like, buddy, just because you're, because you're wealthy doesn't mean you're smart. And you know who the people are smart? They're the ones advising him of everything, and they're taking his money, and they're laughing all the way to the bank. He thinks he's found the fountain of youth. He's going to reverse the aging cycle. Therefore, he will not die. Therefore, he'll be healthy, never have any aches and pains like many of us here, right? That'll never happen. Won't happen. We get new bodies in heaven. That's going to happen. And we'll never have to worry about anything at all that concerns our bodies today. Isn't that a hallelujah? No more tests at the hospital. You thought the tests in school were hard. And then you started to get old. And you started to go to the doctor for tests. And then you wanted to get back for more tests. Then you're waiting for the results of the test. And you're not so sure you're going to hear the results of the test. And then if you hear the results and he says you need surgery and all that stuff, none of that in heaven because we get brand new spanking new bodies. We put off the earth suit, we get a heaven suit. So praise God for a living hope is the title of this section here in, in my Bible, how it's titled. We have an inheritance, nothing's going to perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. 
These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Mm -hmm. So you can cope with God's hope. Now, I know some of you here, and I know some of your stories. Many of you I don't know. And some of you know some of my story, but there's parts of my story I've never shared with anybody. I can guarantee that my title is right on, you can cope with God's hope. Because I've experienced that in my own life, no matter what. And I know some of you here, in some of the trials of life, and how many years you've served God, this is absolutely 100% true. But when I looked at that, I thought, well, let me give you a definition from Scripture, uh, excuse me, from the Cyclopedia, which um, Scripture has even better definitions. The word cope means to deal effectively with something difficult, uh, to deal with and attempt to overcome problems and difficulties. Anybody have any difficulties? Sometimes the hardest person you have to cope with is the one that you look in the mirror at. Not your husband, your wife, your kids, your neighbor. Not that person sits next to you in church and one of sings off key. Um, nobody does that. But, just, yeah. but I was thinking this morning when the worship team was practicing, if you come early, you get a double dose. I come in a little early. I'm sitting here, and the worship team is practicing. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm serious. I'm, I'm getting blessed. And, um, and Sister Paul was talking about the keys. You were saying different keys are supposed to be in. And it's just reminding me of the little story of... Um, what do you get when you throw a piano down a mine shaft? Not that anyone ever did that, but what do you get when you throw a piano down a mine shaft? A broken piano. What? <laughs> a broken piano? That's very good. You get A flat minor. Get it? A flat minor? Okay, that, that's some key. I'm not sure what key it is. I just, that just reminded me of she going through the keys and talking and as they're practicing. But um, I thought, just think about, about coping. And then I thought of a tool that I don't think I've ever used, but I have, and it's called this right here. Now, do we have any carpenters here? I know Pastor Brian is. He does a lot of work in the church and others. Okay, have you ever used one of these, Al? Last week, you too? Okay, I can't say that I've ever used one of these. I have read about them, and I do know some of the stuff they're used for, so I, I mean, I just kind of wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, but a coping saw is a type of bow saw used to cut intricate external shapes and interior cutouts in woodworking or carpentry. It's widely used to cut moldings to create coped rather than miter joints. A coping saw and I wrote this, my own thoughts. A coping saw used correctly will create a good-looking joint and reduce a lot of carpenter stress because a carpenter who wants continued employment must do a great job. Therefore, a coping saw helps you to cope. What do you have to cope with? Uneven floors, corners that aren't 90 degrees. In fact, in reading articles on the coping saw, one of the experienced carpenters says, there's very few places where everything is perfect. Now, let's say the house was built perfect, but we know what happens in time. Things shift, the ground shifts. The wind comes and blows, things move. Temperatures cause things to expand and, and contract. All kind of stuff happens. So now you come into someone's house, you're a carpenter, and it's a small remodeling job they have you doing, and you're wanting to do a great job. So you figure, well, I'll just take my power miter saw, and I'll just cut some... 45s, yeah, I got to get this right here. I'll, <laughs> I'll cut some 45s, and I'll just put a nice little thing together like that, and it's perfect, right? I've got a really nice joint. Only thing is, after you cut it and you go to the wall, the wall makes it go like that. Because the wall, where you have to put this against, this wall's not going, it's going that way, and the other one's going straighter. So now, all of a sudden, you got stuff that doesn't look good. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you worked in carpentry, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Now, you can fill this in with wood putty, but I need to tell you what, unless you sand it well, unless the molding is painted, it just doesn't cut it, okay? And, and it just, it's not the same. In fact, if you're staining the wood, you, you never get a perfect match. I don't think. I've tried that over the years. 
But that's why you have a miter cut. And the miter cut, and I've taken some molding off over the years in homes doing work and painting, and I've seen the miter cuts, and I, I just stand there amazed, like, these guys are really good. I mean, they take the one thing and put it flat against a corner, and then the other piece comes in, they cut from behind it, and it overlaps. And it gives it a perfect look, no matter what the wall looks like. You know, guys agree with me, I'm so far, I'm good, what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. So, a coping saw. Doesn't look like much, got a little tiny thin blade. That'll pop off too. That'll pop off too. <laughs> but you can do a lot with that if you know how to use it. And you'll keep getting jobs because you're going to finish that job and the next door neighbors are going to come over or your sister and brother in law is coming over and you're having a group from the church over and they're seeing how good it was. Hey, hey, who did your work? Oh, that was, that was Keith Holt. He lives up there on King's Highway. Wow, I think I'm going to call. No, don't call me. I'm just, making, I'm just putting my name in there. Okay. Um, he, does, he does good work. I think I'll call him. I, you understand what I'm saying? Because if they come in and look at your work, and they're thinking of having work done, and they see open seams and things aren't straight and things aren't level, they're like, who did your work? Okay, I'll make sure I'll never call that guy. Are you all with me? Yeah. So coping, a coping saw. I don't know if they gave it that name because the word cope also means to cut. I know I looked all this stuff up. Um, but what a great tool to deal with stuff that's not the way it should be, squared or level. In fact, I've been helping my son some. They live in a home that they rent up in, uh, near Robbinsville. It was built in 1845. It's got all the quaint things of that era, the wide plank floors, and all, but it has all the other stuff. Nothing, nothing's really level, and so you, you can look outside the roofs and, you know, inside, but it, it's neat, so you, you have to work with that. That's why you have all kinds of tools. Now, I believe that God has given us the tools that we can make it, and it's called God's Word. There's so many tools in God's Word, and then, and then he gives us, as Pastor Brian talked about, we develop relationships. Don't we need each other? You know, we, we traveled out to visit with some friends, and I told my wife, we can't go to every funeral, but we can do this, and we will, and we will weep with those who weep. There's something about gathering together in times of sorrow. And there's sometimes we gather together, and we rejoice with those who rejoice, Scripture says. It's all part of the body of Christ. Yeah. We weep together, we laugh together, we pray together, we share our lives together, we share our needs and we, we give to help people in need. It's all part of the body of Christ. Some of the tools that God has given us so we can make it through this life. We have a clip here that I need to show before I, my time runs out. Can we show that clip now? Are we ready with that? We can get that up here. There is the green light. The distance she gets on this particular vault is about 22 feet. She has two vaults, remember. Oh, boy. Yes! She has done the best fault of her life. She, she knows what she's done now. Full twist in Sukahara. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Kathy is. Oh, I think Kathy is. Caroni, hear him? And the crowd is on their feet. What a moment for American gymnastics. That's the ten. That's the ten. That's the damn of the Galifate. I think if they don't give her a ten here, the judges may fear for their life. That's right. They will tear the roof apart. Boy, she landed. There it is. She did it. Ten, the gold medal. The, the gold, gold medal. medal goes to Mary Lou Retton. Oh. oh, what a party they'll have in Fairmont, West what Virginia. What a nice shot. Good God. Fantastic. She has 
there's another ball and she's going to take it, huh? Well, if she does the same thing, <laughs> she does. It was no accident, folks, huh? Just to prove it. Oh, look at this. He's not tired now. No. Oh, what a tightly wrapped package of explosive. Mary Lou Rett. Wow, how many remember that moment? If you watch Olympics, of course you remember it. And I think it was the same year that the Americans beat the Russians in ice hockey, for those of you that watch ice hockey. Um, it's an incredible story of a young lady who was inspired to be, to be involved in gymnastics when she was eight years old by watching someone on TV in the Olympics. And she said, I, I want to do that. And when you read her story, she was 16 years old here when she won gold, okay? Um, just, just incredible story. And uh, oh yeah. no, I'm trying to find my, my notes here. Find a minute. 16 years old. Uh, at 1984 Summer Olympics, at the 1984 Summer in Los Angeles, she won a gold medal in the individual all-around competition as well as two silver medals and two bronze medals. She, her nickname is America's Sweetheart. Um, her performance made her one of the most popular athletes in America. Her gold medal, medal win was historic as she was the first American woman to win the all-around gold medal in Olympic gymnastics. Wow, what an achievement. But you need to understand behind the scenes there were problems, in fact, Five weeks before this event, she had surgery. Five weeks. And now she's competing. And everybody's afraid, what's going to happen? Is her knee going to lock up? Is she going to have problems? And, and earlier in life, she had problems with, with hip problems. But through all the difficulties, she pursued the sport. And she's a champion. The first lady on the Wheaties boxes. How about that? Mm -hmm. Woo! And the reason I thought Mary Lou Retton, you know, she's been in the news lately, if you listen to any news. She's, uh, I think, 55 or 56, and she has a rare form of pneumonia that she's been fighting, and she's slowly recovering. You can check that out. She's been in the news for a couple weeks now. Her children have posted things. But I thought, wow. And when you look at Scripture, we often have illustrations comparing the natural achievements of athletes to spiritual things. It is not going to be that we walk through this earth without struggles until we get to heaven, but it's going to be worth it all. Amen. Can you? I can't even imagine how she must have felt when that 10 came up on the screen. She only won by uh, like .05 against another gymnast from another country of the world because never before had an American girl won the gold for all-around gymnastics. I mean, it's just incredible feat. And then she went and she ran it again. She didn't have to because <laughs> you get the best out of your two volts. She got 10 again. Incredible, isn't it? And, uh, but all the problems she faced, she didn't let it stop her from competing. And then she went on to help President Reagan do some things. I liked in the front of a bulletin I had from last week. It said, God never said the journey would be easy, but he did say that the arrival would be worthwhile. So listen, we're going to have some struggles and persecution. Um, so all the things that Peter says there in verses 3, 4, and 5, he says, in these things you greatly rejoice. Mean, mean like leaping for joy. We, we rejoice when we think of all that God has prepared for us. We'd be crazy to say, nah, I don't, I don't want to go places place that's perfect. I don't want to go to a place where I never have any problems. I don't want to go to a place where there's no wars and rumors of wars. I don't want to go to a place where husbands and wife never get in arguments and there's some cold times between them. I don't want to ever go to a place where, you know, the gas prices go high. I don't want to go to a place that's perfect. Are you crazy? You got a choice. Yeah, you got a choice. I mean, I still work part-time for Riverfront Limo. I just took some people up to a cruise. They're looking for having a great time, man. They're going to cruise for 10 days or take places, people to the airport all the time, Missy, and they go to all these great places. They're all looking for a nice time. Some of them, I told these people, I said, and remember where you live, make sure you come back. <laughs> you can get caught up a lot like, oh, man, we're cruising. 
all the food you want to eat, all these beautiful places we're going to visit in the Caribbean and all this kind of stuff, okay? But even visiting those places, there is sin there and the effects of sin in the fallen world. So we'd be crazy not to rejoice greatly when we think of all that God's promises. We read the scriptures of heaven and revelation all through scripture. Wow, what you prepared for us. Down here, people fight and kill for stuff. In heaven, it's going to be paving material, right? We're going to walk in streets like it's gold. But when you're growing up, don't you get caught up with having stuff? Now, if you were in a family and you had a younger brother or sister, you know when you're young, you always think something bigger is better. So here's a nickel, all right? I know this has happened to people. This is the dime. The nickel is bigger than the dime. Do you ever say to your little brother or sister, hey, uh, if you give me that dime of yours, which is small, I'll give you my big nickel. <laughs> and they're not smart enough to figure it out that the dime is twice the value of the nickel. I mean, that's a great deal. Like, it's a win-win for you, right? I get rid of something that's heavier. <laughs> I get something lighter, it's worth more. Right? Anybody ever have that happen when you were kids growing up? You did it to your brother or sister until they figured out that the dime was worth more than the nickel? Well, we think sometimes all this stuff is what really counts. But God has promised so much. We rejoice in that. But then he says, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer in all kinds of trials. Yeah, the trials come. And he's specifically talking about the persecution that Christians are experiencing. Now, we have lots of different kinds of trials. But look at the persecution in many countries of the world. Listen, folks, we are really exempt from persecutions in this country. Yeah, people may laugh at you. Laws may change. But you worry about someone walking in today and locking you all up because you're in a church, worshiping in the open? Are you? I'm not. It might be coming, but right now, here we are, right? Are you worried about them coming and confiscating your property or burning your home to the ground with no recourse because you're a believer in Jesus Christ? See, we have a lot of freedoms. When I say that, please take advantage of your freedom to share every chance you have about what Jesus means to you when God gives you open doors. Amen. Use it wisely. Maybe someday we won't have this because in those countries of the world, we have missionaries basically that are in countries of the world undercover because if it was out in the open who they really were, they could be locked up, never heard from again, killed, everything taken, whole nine yards because of the persecution that land. That's against Christians. So these people were facing all kinds of trials, is what Peter's saying here. But he's saying to them that these have come so that your faith, which is greater than gold, which perishes, by the way, all the stuff that we have is going to perish. I don't care what it is you hold on to. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you have gold, silver. I don't care if you have a car collection. I picked the family up early in the morning the other day, and... Uh, I said, can I turn around here because it was dead end street? And he said, oh, yeah, the neighbors won't matter. And as I pulled in, they have a wide garage. And then next to it was a little garage that was, like, built to add on. I said, oh, I see they built a little garage. He said, oh, yeah, he said the neighbor had a Corvette. He must have really valued it. He built a separate little garage just for the Corvette. I'm like, wow. I said, does he still have it? He says, she says, I don't know. He died. Wife probably sold it. Now, that to him was valuable. If you have a double car garage, I'm just saying, could you not make room in that garage for your car? But you're going to spend 30 grand or more to build a separate building next to your garage to put your Corvette in. He didn't take it with him. I hope he was a believer. I know nothing about the family. See, everything here is going to perish. Gold, whatever you have, whatever you think is precious, it's all going to be perish. It's all going to perish. But the trials will really prove if we really have faith in Jesus. As the, as the gold goes through and all the impurities are taken away, the gold comes out and it shines, and all those impurities go to the side. We go through the fires. It shows if we're really believers in Jesus. I'm not going to say I've had some hard places in life. So have you. But the writer of the song, It Is Well With My Soul, he says it so good. It is well with my soul. When the trials come, those sea billows rolled, even so, it is well, it is well with my soul. I said to someone not long ago, I said, well, I said, my body's not done so good, but it's well with my soul. That's what really counts, isn't it? Because all this stuff that we hang on to, and use wisely whatever God's given you. Be, be a blessing with it to other people around you. But everything is left behind. 
but we will take to heaven ourselves if we follow Jesus and not walk away. And my concern always as a pastor, and you know, Pastor Brian too, is that when people that we know go through trials, will they walk away and curse God because he didn't answer prayer or allowed them to go through that, or will they draw closer to God? Now, don't think it can't happen because we know people that it has happened to. And Job's wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, see, it's easy to forget all the blessings, isn't it? When you're going through the fire, all of a sudden, where are you, God? Why, what have I ever done to deserve this? You didn't answer my prayer. You're, if you're a God of love, and Satan's right there saying, yep, 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 zip. If he's a God of love, why allow this to happen? Will you persevere through the trial, whatever it may be? And Job's words to his wife are really right on. You speak as a foolish woman. Should we accept only good at the hands of God, not bad? In other words, do we think somehow that life is a bed of roses for us as a Christian? Nothing's going to go wrong. We're going to walk through a fallen world, and when I touch a rose, my hand will never touch a thorn that's on the rose stem. Are you all with me? Yeah. Unfortunately, I know people that have turned bitter who once served God, wholeheartedly served God, praised God in church, served him, Sunday school teachers, you name it, pastors. And then stuff happened, and they turned bitter. You can turn bitter, or you can turn better. But look what's, look what's waiting for us. We're going to give all that up for what? What do, you, what do you have if you walk away from God? What, what do you have going for you? You got nothing. That's what you got going for you. But with God, no matter how hard the trial, you know it gets better. You put your sunglasses on because the future's bright. So Paul, uh, Peter says this there. The trials, they're going to come. The persecution for being a believer, the stuff that happens with your own body wearing out and struggles around you and all kind of stuff that happens in life. But it's going to prove what's in your heart. And I'm going to tell you what, over the years as a pastor, I have been blessed by people going through trials to see their faith in the midst of the hard places. I remember saying to my wife at times, you know, some of the, the, the hard places for a pastor, and I don't know about Pastor Brian, was when I'd have to go into a hospital to visit people. And you're going in to visit people who are going through all kind of stuff, and you're going in to encourage them and trying to be a blessing to them. Some of them are close to the point of death, and you're trying to encourage them. And I said to my wife a couple of times, I said, I went in to pray and encourage that person. I came out encouraged because their faith was shining through all the junk that was happening in their life. You understand what I'm talking about? You understand that. It's just the faith came out. It was there. It was genuine. They weren't belittling God. They weren't bitter toward God. They weren't angry at God. They weren't complaining and blah, blah, blah. They were saying, God has helped me. He has been with me all through the journey. He said he'd never leave me or forsake me. I have felt his presence and his peace in the midst of this trial, and I know he will never desert me, and one day I'm going to see him face to face. That's what it's talking about here, going through the trials. Now listen, I'm with you if you say to me, <laughs> uh, would you like pain in your body? Would you like to be perfectly healthy? It doesn't take me long to answer that question. I'd like to be perfectly healthy. But that's not life on the planet, is it? We have times of great health. We have times of great enjoyment, family events together. And then we have times of, of great pain. They all come together. How will I shine for Jesus in the darkness when I go through the dark places of my life? Will I still be shining? I like the little lady who um, was in a bomb shelter in England when uh, Hitler was bombing England, trying to break the back of England. They never surrendered. They held firm. And the bombs are dropping. And uh, she's falling asleep. And the lady next to her says, Thank you. She says, I have a God who never sleeps or slumbers. There's no sense two of us being awake. <laughs> and I can't do anything about the bombs dropping anyhow. But my faith is in God. 
It's not a simplistic, stupid statement. It's just a reality of Scripture. My faith is in God no matter what's happening around me. He will help me until the day he calls me home. And I'm going to live for him every day until that day. And on that great day, hallelujah, your faith proved genuine may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, when you think of a person like Mary Lou Retton and you've read stories of other great athletes, I mean, I just, I, I wasn't there. I just watched video clips and watched on TV. But the electricity that must have been in that building when she saw that score 10 come up and everybody knew she had won it all from all the other previous events she had done compared to this other girl she was competing against. It was just, it was incredible. The electricity and the applause of the crowd and the praise. And she's standing there. I can't, I can't imagine, 16 years old, right? Do you remember when you were 16? I didn't think of anything but getting my driver's license in Pennsylvania, which I did. I couldn't imagine getting a gold medal in the Olympics. But the, the wow, the electricity in that building. But she went through a lot of trials to get there. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to be a gymnast. I'm going to enter in and win. No, eight years of training, all the injury surgery. All the Can you imagine that great day when we stand before the Lord? Wow. With thousands upon thousands singing praises to his name. Glory, honor, riches, power, wisdom be unto you, O God. And being there, being reunited with all the saints that have gone on before, some of them, your own family members, people from the life of this church, and many others that you never met but you read about in Scripture, wow, what a day it's going to be. And I need to tell you that with God's help, we can make it. We cope with God's hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Lord Jesus, today, I have not said probably anything new to many of these people that have come to this church for 50, 60 years, 20 years, 10 years. But they're just reminders to all of us, Lord, of what you're doing in our life. You have so much prepared for us, and we rejoice in all you prepared, though it seems for a season we're going to go through trials it's all part of that great day when we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to hear those words. Those words will happen if we have been faithful, if we have persevered through the hard places. Mary Lou Retton heard those words, in essence, by the crowd cheering her on, her coaches and everything, but she had worked for it. It just didn't happen. And we pray for her now, Lord, as she recovers from pneumonia. I don't know anything about her spiritual condition, Lord, but I would pray that she'd know you as saving, Lord, if she doesn't already, and that you just help her during this difficult time. But Lord, we want to stand before you someday with all the heroes of the faith that we talked about heroes, all the names that are recorded and names yet to be recorded. We're in that group of people if we choose to follow you and say yes to what you want us to do with our lives. We can cope with you, Jesus, the living hope, the hope of glory. We commit our lives again to you. We thank you that you're faithful and you will help us. You will provide everything we need. And we determine from this day forward, we will choose to follow you no matter what. We will choose like the three Hebrew children. Our God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. But we're not bowing to this idol of gold. And I thought when I read that scripture again, the idol of gold, how many people bow to the idol of money? And their, their things in life, are, the main things are their possessions and all that stuff that comes to their gods. They're not going to bow to any of that stuff. Our God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't deliver us from the fire furnace, we're not compromising. We're not bowing. We're not bending. Make us those kind of people, Lord. Till that great day, you call us home, and we'll be able to say, it has been worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. I pray your blessings on Pastor 
Brian and Paul, I pray you minister healing and strength from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, likewise to his wife. I pray for this church, Lord, you continue to pour out your spirit and continue to make this church a blessing, a great lighthouse here in Salem County. And we give you praise again in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for letting me be being with you again today. God bless you. Come on, give God some praise in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor. What a good reminder. Don't forget your dime. Yeah, I'll give you a dime. I'll give you a nickel for a dime. <laughs> you know, it's true is that we are really blessed, and we have a hope. And if you grab on to God's hope, you can cope. Amen. But before we go, before we go however God wants to do, we want to go with God's presence. We want to go God's way. You know, and um, Pastor himself and his wife has been through a lot, some tough times. And being past, just being a pastor, you go through stuff. But within his own family, so he knows what he's talking about in this aspect. And that being said, um, what are you facing? What are you facing that's really difficult and heavy on your heart? What are you facing that seems to drain you, not fill you? I mean, do you allow God's hope to really be the thing that fills you when maybe, maybe some of your people in your family just are so far from God? Maybe, um, you know, um, maybe you lost your job or maybe whatever, it be, whatever that is. I think all of us can think of one thing that sometimes when it comes to hope, or maybe when you look at someone to be able to be the person that's going to help you is the one that gives you an anchor and not a hand up, but an anchor down. I mean, it could come in so many ways. But we don't just have hope up here just because it's a nice full little word. It really means holding on to promises every day, God's promises. And when things get tough, and they will, because as Pastor said, we live in a fallen world, that's where hope comes in. So I want you to close your eyes right where you are before we change direction here. And, but is there something in your heart and life that you're finding it difficult to cope? You're finding that the hope in God seems to be a little bit wearing, getting thin, and you just feel like your problem is becoming bigger than the person of Jesus Christ. The problem's bigger than you think the power of Almighty God. And if you can think of one thing where you are, I want you to just raise your hand where you are. Just raise your hand. And then raise your hand. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else? Raise your hand. You figure there's something in your life you just, you know, it's tough to cope with. I want you to know, I want you, everybody, stand to your feet. I want you to know that there's times in every one of our lives we will go through trials and troubles and tribulations, the three T's of life. They, they come because we're living in a fallen world, but greater is he that's in us and in the world. But the thing is, we need to take our mind and our focus on the word of God and let the word of God be our strength. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what happened? When he was tempted, Jesus always answers with the word. So I want you to take that now, those that raise your hand. We're going to pray, and I want you to give it to God. Open it and give it to God. Don't let the devil rob your strength. Don't let the devil take away what God has already promised. Don't let your, what you're seeing uh, get your eyes on one thing and not see what God's leading you to. Because whatever you're in, God's going to lead you to something from something and that's what rises up testimonies i've been in some really tough situations and i've often said god no i, I don't understand this and and this, i remember one time god said you don't have to am i am i yours and i said absolutely i'm in it to win it then trust me that changed my life i've never been the same through the ups and through the downs through the prosperity or through the the, the weeds and the not having two nickels or a dime and a nickel to rub together. God has been faithful. 
So if you have that thing in your hand, raise it right before the Lord. Just put it in your hand. Raise it before the Lord. And as I'm praying, and we're going to just, as we're praying, and we all at times and seasons have these heavy things that come upon us, and they seem that the enemy wants to drain us. But there is a hope that God says, with me, all things are possible. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. That is either true or that is not true. You know, the word of God is faithful or he is not faithful. You have to declare who you you're going to serve no matter what comes your way no matter what winds blow no matter what water comes in your boat he's still the same god that causes it to flow can you say amen, amen. So, Father, we just come before you today, Lord, as a decoration to reminding us it is in your word that strength comes to our heart, to our soul. <laughs> And Father, I pray right now, Lord, as we just release it out of our hands, out of our hearts, we give it to you. We no longer let it control our emotions. We no longer let it control our thoughts. Lord, we're going to let you control us by the word of God. We're going to trust you that you do our battles. You do our fightings. Father, we ask right now that you just do the work that needs to be done upon bodies, upon minds, upon situations, upon families. Father, upon those who are far from the Lord. Whatever it is, God, we're going to focus on the promises that you have made unto us. And when you make a promise, you always keep it. And so, Father, I pray right now, we receive, I pray that you would take each one of your vessels deeper into your word this week. They'll never experience your strength. They'll never experience the freshness of your waters if they are not in your streams. So, Father, I pray right now that you take them deeper as they get into your word this week, as they forget about all the stuff on the right and the left. And they get started on what your word says. Father, take them deeper in you and let their faith arise and their enemies be scattered. Father, we ask right now that we are standing on your promises. We declare right now to follow you and your ways. We're going to trust you because you see the beginning and the end. So, Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Thank you for a reminder today that we can have this incredible hope, the hope of glory. Father, we are grateful that we can hold unto promises every day and we can cope and do what we need to do that others may see you in us. The Lord, as we walk and be light and salt, will you just touch each one? We let it go. We release it into your name. We ask this God that we no longer carry but cast and we look for what you're going to do as you rise up the testimony and rise up all that needs to be done for your glorification, for your praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. come on, give them some praise in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Never look at your situation. Look at your Savior. Amen. Give someone a big high five and tell them I'm, I'm praying for you this week. Go with his presence. Go with his peace and make a difference. Those well, we thank you for joining us today. Let's continue to believe that God is going to do a work in all of our lives and in his church, despite our current circumstances. If you would like to support the ministry of Salem First Assembly, you can do so by mailing to 430 Route 45, Salem, New Jersey, 08079, or by visiting our website at salemfirstag.org. Please join us for service next Sunday at 1030 a.m., or you can watch service every Sunday afternoon on Facebook at Salem First Assembly or YouTube at Salem First AG. You can also listen to the message every Tuesday on Podbean. Have a blessed rest of your day. Let's remember to be a blessing and that life is living in faith every day.